Good afternoon. It's Thursday, the 28th of May 2015, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host this afternoon, Brian Gerrish. I'll be joined by Skype Link, link by Mike West from Bastion Radio. And uh, we've got Nick Green behind the technical desk. Well, what's on the weather front? I just take the reports from our chat box and I'm afraid to say that uh, although we've got a bit of cloud and sunny spells in Rhonda, Manchester's looking a bit gloomy. And uh, that's the report from most of the rest of UK. Although somebody's uh, quietly told us that, of course, there is a lot of sunshine in California and a drought. Uh, that's a very interesting subject, which perhaps UK Column ought to come on to. So um, if you're there in California and watching, hello from us. Thank you very much for joining. Well, uh, where do we go today? Uh, we see a rapid escalation in the deliberate breakdown of uh, the British state. We see attacks on our constitution. We see attacks on common law. And increasingly, we are seeing the state attacking anybody who dares to stand up and point a finger as to what's been happening. And this appears to be the case with uh, the recent takedown of um, Bastion Radio. So I'm going to pass across to um, Mike. Tell us uh, what's been happening to you. Hi, Brian. How are you doing? Um, I've, I've not got your screens here, so I won't be able to preview anything that you're putting up on the screen at the moment for some reason. But anyway, good afternoon. Um, yes, uh, Fun and Games. It's our uh, Third time the uh, uh, well the, the website itself has been attacked. This time just taken down totally. Um, so it's our third move in just about the same amount of period of time in months, as it were. Uh, uh, whilst you were on Sunday with us as well, you saw that our YouTube channel was being attacked uh, twice. Um, the reason why we know it's attacked is because they're um, attacking the ports. Uh, at this end, um, I, I have a software. Um, network analyzer called Wireshark, which um, highlights when we're under attack and when we're under significant attack on Sunday. Um, just as you come on and started to discuss um, some of the comments, but a lot of people saying maybe it's because we discussed the um, uh, so-called or presumed um, neutron bomb attack in Yemen. Um, but I, I, I'm skeptical to that. Uh, uh, you know, we, we get these random attacks. Um, quite on a regular basis, but this one was really significant. They've not only managed to take the Bastion website down, but whoever's done it has targeted my business website as well. Right. It, isn't it interesting that uh, we, we've now got a very large number, thousands of people who are trying to get information out. They're doing it very simply with uh, uh, podcasts. Uh, they're putting up small video clips. But obviously the tr the truth, I'm going to say the truth that's coming out in these alternative media forms is so scary to the establishment that they are now in the business of taking direct action. Uh, interesting point for you. What were we talking about that caused the problem? Uh, I'm going to say I would, I would guess that it's been Bastion Radio's exposure of Capita, uh, which yeah. is beginning to make these people very, very nervous. What, would you agree with that? Um, yeah, I, we've sustained significant attacks since we've um, started looking into them. Um, so much so last week, um, I had my edit, my video editing machine, um, the software that I use for my editing and the live broadcast software um, were totally mis, uh, messed up. Um, I had to reinstall that machine to get things working. Hence, there's a delay on um, the third part of the capita. Um, uh, documentary that we're doing at the moment um, so that that's been put back hopefully by Friday that should be out tomorrow um, but that's that's caused delays um, we're just seeing regular attacks no matter what security I do this end um, it's penetrated um, to the point now that when I'm not using machines I have to turn them off because even with all the protection on my um, router and on the individual PCs that I use um, I, I have to turn them off now um, just to prevent any further attacks yeah. that's getting a bit silly at the moment and the, the point the situation we're at with bastion radio at the moment is that we made a decision on monday to stop until we have a rethink um and see where we go from here we, we you know obviously we <laughs> it costs money to set up different servers every time i've paid out a year in, a, in advance because you have to with, with um, good hosting deals 
um, three times in three months, and it's just getting a bit um, silly now. I keep having to pay out and then find ourselves having to move on again um, in a yeah. month's time. Well, uh, Mike, we, we, of course, are very happy to lend a helping hand if we can. Uh, perhaps we should also remind viewers that uh, Chris Spivy started to come under attack once he began to expose, expose what was really happening around uh, Lee Rigby. Uh, very nasty stuff going on there for Chris uh, Spivy. And, of course, the uh, usual tactic, if the state can't uh, bully you into silence, well, what's the next thing to do? Come after your children. And that's the theme that we're going to be returning to in the news today. Well, um, Mike, um, I know you're tight for time. Please stay with us as, as long as you can. Okay. Um, that will be very nice. Uh, I thought we'd just lead on through by reminding ourselves of um, this gentleman here, Mr. M uh, David Miliband. And uh, he's been creeping back into the press. Remember that this man threw his toys out the pram when he didn't uh, win the Labour leadership. Uh, so um, Ed got it. So David threw all his teddy boys, uh, teddy bears out the pram and he disappeared off to uh, New York uh, to start working with um, uh, what many would regard as a dubious uh, international charity, um, some backing from George Soros. Uh, so usual thing. I can't play in UK politics. I'm going to run away to another country. Uh, but isn't it interesting that British media started to bring him back into the frame? Well, we thought we'd remind ourselves a bit about this man. Um, so whilst Miliband was spouting about Britain in the Telegraph, of course, it was the Daily Mail uh, that exposed his hypocrisy and lies. David Miliband exposed as being behind the cover up of Britain's secret involvement in torture of terror suspects. And uh, in the article, uh, they really went for it because they said he did. A, he gave an interview to the New Statesman's magazine in 2009. I abhor anything that constitutes torture, waterboarding. It's perfectly clear to me it's torture. I've never su supported extraordinary rendition to torture. Always said that Guantanamo, uh, Guantanamo Bay should be closed. There's no clash of ideals and pragmatism there. Um, and then a year after his abhorred torture interview, he was, he was exposed as being behind a cover-up of one of the most shameful episodes in New Labour's rule, Britain's secret involvement in the torture of terror suspects overseas. Well, they've forgot about lies over weapons of mass destruction there, uh, but at least they're uh, exposing this man. And what did he do? Well, three times he went to obtain public interest immunity certificates which stop official documents being uh, released. And this obviously was to conceal MI5's dirty little secrets. So we've got a state that can spend huge amounts of money covering up the fact that the British government and British uh, secret services were, in, uh, were involved in the torture of individuals, uh, but they've got enough uh, power and clout and hardware uh, to come shutting down the likes of your site, Mike. Any thoughts on the uh, Miliband brothers? Um, well, yeah, I think it said it all, really, didn't it, at the time of they were electing the leader for the Labour Party. Two brothers against each other, a bit of a Cain and Abel situation, if you want to get biblical about it. Um, you know, one, they seem to stab each other in the back. Now, if they're prepared to do that within their own family, what are they prepared to do with us? And then you've got the likes of Tony Blair, um, who I understand at this uh, moment in time is... Um, uh, openly standing down as uh, Middle Middle East uh, peace envoy. Sorry, whilst I laugh while and try and get them that sentence together. Um, <clears throat> he's standing down in June. I just wonder if there's something bigger playing out here, Brian. Um, is it is it catching up with Tony Blair now? Is he being forced to stand down? And um, will we eventually see um, as many countries after him? Don't forget, he's on many wanted lists for breaking. Um, not only human rights um, crimes as well, but war crimes. Um, I'm just wondering now if these past is uh, starting to catch up with him. Uh, well, I, I would hope so. It, it's difficult to tell, isn't it? This cabal of individuals, they sometimes are promoting their own. Other times they seem to creep off into the sidelines. Uh, but yeah, I could agree that it may well be getting too hot for uh, Tony Blair, that there's a real possibility 
that either he gets taken to a, a proper court or somebody decides to take the law into their own hands. Um, but what we can say is that if we look at new labor, of course, new labor was the utter betrayal of old labor. This was the Marxist ideology coming in. And let's remember that the Miliband brothers came straight out of a Marxist household with Ra Ralph Miliband and uh, together with uh, Prescott, Gordon Brown helped into power by the Scottish communists. Uh, this is uh, the real Marxist element uh, trying to take control of British politics. So um, they may be dispersed <coughs> overseas at the moment, but I think these are very, very dangerous uh, individuals. Meanwhile, at home, we've um, had tr more trouble on the streets. Uh, this is um, um, uh, Douglas Carswell here coming um, under attack by a mob um, in London. And of course, what were they shouting? Well, he's racist scum, he's a UKIP racist. Uh, absolutely fascinating that we have this small <laughs> violent group with lots of banners, socialist workers being some of them, get the Tories out. Uh, but the state surveillance system apparently had no idea these violent individuals were, were going to come onto the streets. Um, luckily, Mr. Carswell said, uh, although he was a bit shaken, he was fine. And I think we've got to give him credit for his statement here. He says, as an MP, I will always use public transport and I don't want to live in a society where the politicos don't. Well, that's uh, pretty brave words. And we're going to say to him, well done for that, because, of course, if uh, the people we supposedly elect can't move around in public, we're in a pitiful state. But UK Column would like to say, who are these violent protesters? And more importantly, who funded them? This is the key to it. Uh, who's providing money for these groups where they can suddenly appear with very posh banners? And the UK Column is going to continue to warn of subversive state-incited protest. And as we've reported over the last couple of days, of course, the police themselves have been dropping hints that their intelligence staff have been put on unlimited overtime and um, they've had their summer leave stopped uh, because the government expects trouble. <clears throat> My thought is that uh, this is the government going to agitate trouble because it then gives uh, uh, David Cameron an easy platform to bring his state clamp down on. Do you think I'm being pessimistic here, Mike? What's your no, take? No, not at all. Um, you know, We've got sort of um, flavours here from the Thatcher years coming back, haven't we? Here we are, we've got police uh, being told that there's cuts left, right and centre. They're cutting the force in their thousands. Uh, but there's unlimited overtime um, for these situations where the protests are starting to take off now. Uh, this thing with um, Douglas Carswell and UKIP, and uh, I think most of the problems within the Labour Party and UKIP um, uh, are being caused intentionally. The media is playing to it. Um, because all the time they're doing that, they're taking the focus away from the damage um, the Tories are doing behind the scenes. And let's face it, I think after next month, once um, George Osborne's uh, made his announcements on this uh, budget um, that he's going to bring in, we're really going to see what the Tories are all about. Um, so, yeah, I see all this as in incitement. Um, I think they want to stir up the trouble because um, hopefully by June, as the Tory, in you know, the way the Tories will be thinking, is, is that there'd be so much going on um, in the media, as it were, then it might take the, a, a lot of the focus away from the Tory plans that they, they want to bring in. Um, and it's not just austerity I'm talking about. I'm talking about the, um, uh, well, well, all the plans that they've got for us, us domestic terrorists, and the further restrictions to civil liberties, um, which the Tories are eager to bring in as well, like taking away your human rights. Yeah. Well, we're going to we'll move on a little bit into that subject, starting with uh, this. Um, a number of people have been flagging up that uh, there are reports of a special event uh, this year around Magna Carta. And here's a fascinating Telegraph article. It says, treason. Magna Carta barons face trial 800 years on. Um, and what is all this about? Well, we decided we'd take a little delve into it. We know it's very important. We're going to do more work on it. But uh, just look at that headline, Magna Carta Barons, Treason. Uh, this is a very, very interesting um, uh, nudge and spin propaganda on the public mind. This is some of the text. 
Uh, they have long been credited with helping to lay the foundations of the British state as we know it today, based on the rule of law, the right to a fair trial and the protection of private property. But this summer, the barons and bishops who forced King John to agree to the Magna Carta are to be tried for treason. 800 years after the historic signing of the document at Runnymede, Berkshire, June the 15th, 2015, sen senior lawyers including the president of the uh, UK of the UK Supreme Court will sit in judgment on the barons and bishops who gathered by the River Thames after refusing to surrender London to King John to decide whether they acted lawfully or were in <laughs> fact guilty of treasonable behavior so we've got many of those who are assisting the treasonous breakdown of our constitution and justice system are now going to sit in judgment of those that gave us freedom and justice. This seems to be, to me, just to be a fantastic propaganda exercise uh, where you are spinning the truth so that black has become white and white's become black. We're going to try the barons who created the, the Magna Carta, we're gonna try them for uh, treason. So where's this lot come from? Well, we need to just have a look at this. This is uh, from the Magna, uh, Magna Carta Trust. Uh, you can go on the uh, website, sorry, the internet and have a look at this for yourself. A lot of very good information. Encourage you to look at the, the, the facts. And of course, here we are already on this page uh, featuring Lord Neuberger. Um, so he's now got become very big on uh, the importance of the Magna Carta. But let's remember, we've now got judges um, who are going to judge those who created essentially our, uh, our um, constitution and uh, law. So where's all this come from? We thought a UK column wiring diagram would assist it. Let's have a look. Uh, we've got a docudrama, which we say is uh, going to attack and trivialise and undermine our constitution. Uh, but how does it describe itself celebrating 800 years of democracy? Uh, we'll be coming on to democracy uh, when we talk about children. Um, so according to the website, all of this goes back to October 56, 1956, when representatives from the English-speaking Union, the Pilgrims of Great Britain, the Royal Empire Society, the Victoria League, Overseas League, National Trust, uh, and High Commissioners uh, planned a Magna Carta Trust. Uh, well, that gets set up, and then there's government Magna Carta stakeholders, uh, which includes HM Treasury. Well, why do you need the Treasury? Uh, because you need lots of money, a million pounds, in order to kick off your propaganda. And what better person than to provide the money from a very, very tight conservative budget? We can't feed people. But here was a million pounds out of um, George Osborne's purse to set up the Magna Carta Trust. And who do we need to be uh, a key patron? Well, we need the Queen to come in there. Uh, so there we are, Magna Carta Trust, and the Queen is our patron. And then we set up a Magna Carta 800th committee, and uh, the great and the good are selected for that. So we've got Sir Robert Worcester, chairman of the Magna Carta committee. Uh, and uh, you need to go and have a look at this committee yourself. You'll understand why. Here we are. There are so many names on this committee, it cannot possibly be real. There are too many people there to have any proper decision-making process. So I'm going to guess with a slight bit of UK column cynicism uh, that amongst all those names, it's only been driven by a few. And then if we hop across, we've got members of the 800th Advisory Board. And surprise, surprise, we've got the similar thing then a mass of names. There's the whole of the elite, the great and good. And I just thought I'd pull out the Director General of the BBC, Mark Thompson. So there we are. Uh, this is the organisation which is going to put the barons on trial for treason. Uh, we couldn't find any money to put our politicians on trial for treason. Uh, but it uh, seems to me we've got the BBC backing an attempt to twist history and, as I've said, make black white. 
Did you know anything about this, Mike? This, uh, this could be new to you. There's a few oxymorons in there as well, isn't there? Um, you know, Magna Carta Trust. Uh, and then at the same time, you've got um, the patron, the Queen, which I think is the biggest traitor uh, in this country ever um, to allow a mediatization status that she's in at this very moment. And the BBC in there as well, uh, not to be trusted. Um, just it's just another distraction, Brian. Let's face it. I mean, if they're going to be trying people um, from all those years ago, I mean, what right of reply have these people got? Um, none at all. So it's, it sounds like it's, you know, just any old justice case um, that you could witness today. It's all, it's all done and set in stone before any case is even heard in a courtroom. Um, I presume this is the same thing. It's another way, like you say, it, it's shaping um, people to say, oh, we need change, we need this. It's, everything's change, change, change. And uh, this is just one of the processes of it, I'm afraid. Uh, well, you've you've raised a particularly good point there, Mike, because, of course, uh, the people who were involved can't defend themselves in this uh, kangaroo court. Exactly, yeah. Um, isn't it interesting that uh, we've got the British state can run a, a trial about events 800 years ago. They can run trials about child abuse events uh, 70 years ago. What we can't do is run trials about current child abuse cases. Well, Jimmy Savile. Well, what's happening? He's dead, um, but he's quite recent. We've, oh, what's happened with this Jimmy Savile inquiry? Where's the BBC and all this? They put themselves on other projects like this, the Magna Carta thing, uh, and, you know, commission documentaries to look into um, uh, survivors of um, child abuse. Um, but at the same time, where, where's, what's, what's happened to the BBC inquiry about the Savile inquiry? That's huge. It's massive. Well, we don't hear nothing about that. Well, of course not. The idea is to drag it out as long as possible, keep it in the long grass, and then people slowly forget about it. But uh, yeah. we won't be forgetting. Let's come back to the Barons. Uh, this is uh, what the Telegraph had to say. It says July's mock trial is being staged to determine whether the Barons of Bishops behind the document were justified in law in breaching their promise to surrender London to King John and then forcing him to sign the document limiting his powers. Tremendous spin going on here, breaching their promise, forcing him to sign the document li limiting his powers. And then this is where I found some really interesting stuff. Although it was quickly annulled by Pope Innocent III on the grounds it was illegal and had been signed by King John under duress. So we, we describe the barons as breaching their promise. They forced the king, that's sort of a threat. And here comes the good Pope, uh, because he quickly annulled it on the grounds it was illegal and the king had signed it under duress. Interestingly enough, duress is one of the um, uh, core common law defences, uh, but now apparently this is uh, uh, all to do with Pope Innocent III. Um, we think this is a misleading inference that uh, the Pope had the right to make a judgment on the Magna Carta well, who was this man? Have a look for yourselves. But uh, he was pretty big on heresy. I think that means inquisition and torturing people. And he was also pretty good at uh, running the Crusades in the Middle East, which, of course, also uh, murdered and killed uh, hundreds of thousands of people. So interesting to see him promoted by the, uh, uh, by the Telegraph. Um, I'll give you a right to reply on that little section, Mike. Well, I, sorry, Brian, I, I, that, that, that's something I've not really looked into um, and I'm be very interested to look into. Um, yeah. I, I, no, I just fair, fair enough. I don't want to catch you on, on, on yeah, the hoof. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I do know that there are many people watching the uh, emerging power of the Vatican. That is how I'm going to put it. And of course, the Vatican has a very powerful hand at the moment in what's taking place in the Middle East. Very little of it appears in the paper, uh, but uh, immense power from the Vatican. Let's remember the Vatican Bank. Uh, it's interesting that the Telegraph's promoting it. So we just finish off this the uh, section here. Uh, back to that article, um, if you can, Nick. Can we bring that up on screen? Thank you. And uh, the trial will be judged by Lord Neuberger, the president of the UK Supreme Court, uh, Dame Elisa, Chief Justice of New Zealand, and the Honourable Stephen Breyer, Associate Justice of the US Supreme Court. 
Well, isn't it interesting that we've got somebody there from New Zealand? Because, of course, we've had the New Zealand judge Goddard being brought in uh, to head up the uh, uh, child abuse inquiry that isn't happening. Uh, we decided to put Melanie Shaw on screen there because a massive effort by Brit uh, British judiciary, overseas judiciary, to try somebody from 800 years ago, but they don't seem to be able to get to grips with the paedophiles who were operating at a children's home in Nottingham. So yesterday we flagged up the opaque system by which Britain's judges are appointed. So this was the courts and tribunals uh, section saying that uh, they were now appointed by a committee. It was independent, but not to worry because um, the Lord Chancellor has a veto. Well, not really a veto, although it is a veto. Don't worry, it's independent. And if you want to see how independent it is, have a look at the commission. But of course, it didn't actually say how the commission members were appointed. And at the moment, the Judicial Appointments Commission doesn't want to seem to reply to the UK column. Well, if justice is in a mess, uh, don't worry, because of course, our monarch is going to look after us. And uh, she's been very busy reopening Parliament for the six, uh, 62nd time. So here was a glorious picture uh, in the mail. Uh, Prince Philip looking um, uh, full of concern for his fellow, uh, fellow men. Uh, apparently the Queen was a bit hot with all the velvet and a two and a half pound crown. Yeah. I, think, I think that crown should have been weighed in kilos actually. I think the paper made a bit of a mistake there, but not to worry. Um, but she's 90 or whatever it is, so probably this was hard work. Let's have a look at what she said. Uh, my government will legislate in the interests of everyone in the country. I think there's a nice bit of um, double speak in there because is she, are they legislating in the real interests of everybody in the country or does it mean they're going to legislate to get into the interests of everyone in the country? I think the latter. Uh, but this is the key bit. It will adopt a one nation approach, helping working people get on. Uh, supporting aspiration, giving new opportunities to the most disadvantaged and bringing, to, bringing together different parts of the country. This is all lovey-dovey language out of Cameron. Uh, what did he have to say? Sorry, this is a bit small, but he said he will drive through a raft of controversial new laws within months as he seeks to capitalise on his political honeymoon. Uh, the Prime Minister told MPs he will not waste a single moment with getting on with the task of reshaping Britain. To which we say, well, firstly, what is the nation that these people talk about? David Cameron's continually talking about our nation. I get the uh, nasty little feeling that they're talking about a completely different nation to us. Is this the privileged and the wealthy or is there something darker at hand? Mike, I'll just see what you say about that. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> just just a word to Nick. I think he may have the camera turned off your end um, for the feedback here on um, Skype. I'm not seeing any of the screens. But, okay. yeah, just, just quickly, Brian. Um, well, it just seems to me that the, the Queen's roles and David Cameron's roles have flipped, isn't it? Here we have the uh, second Tory speech, as I call it, um, which has been given by the Queen. Um, she seems to be more of a spokeswoman for the Conservative Party now. And um, um, like David Cameron says, you know, it's his nation now by the sound of it. Um, and, um, he, he, he sounded more like a dictator every day. Um, again, for people that uh, doubt that and don't think that's going to be the case, I just wait and see until these um, um, new bits of legislation he wants to hurry through the door along with Theresa May. Um, people might be, if they, if they put the tick in the box for the Conservatives at this last election, they might be regretting that sooner than they think. Um, yeah, so I, I think the whole thing's flipped, um, to be honest, Brian. Um, the Queen, she's nothing more than a spokesman now for the government. And it seems to me the person that's really running this nation is David Cameron. Uh, well, I'm going to just say probably David Cameron, of course, with permission of his very wealthy international banking backers, because, uh, of course, it's the peop the, it is the people who control the money who've got the real power. Yeah, I did mean to say David Cameron PLC, which encompasses... <laughs> Capita. Um, uh, 
Well, everything, yeah. Um, he, he's got his fingers in all pies, and so has his extended family, as we know. Yeah. Well, uh, plenty of money for the uh, dripping elite in and around Parliament. Uh, not so much money for Britain's armed forces, uh, but we couldn't resist this little article from the Plymouth Herald. It says that Plymouth Battleship is going to take over as the Royal Navy flagship next week. I always like the term battleship because in the public mind, big, powerful ships. Well, what are they talking about? Uh, well, basically, they're talking about HMS Ocean, which is simply a helicopter carrier, command and control ship. Uh, but we've got uh, the nuclear submarine fleet uh, badly affected by defects uh, and, and major problems with uh, spares, etc. We've got the same sorts of problems going on in the Trident nuclear submarines. Uh, but we've got local media hype that's promoting a helicopter carrier as a battleship. And this bit made me smile because it says, <clears throat> excuse me, Ocean is also paving the way for aircraft carrier Queen Elizabeth, which will assume the role of the Royal Navy's flagship when she enters service. So this is jammed to, uh, tomorrow because, of course, we don't have this magical carrier in service. And even if we did, there are no aircraft to go on it. So... This is very <coughs> poor reporting at the best of times, excuse me. Um, but uh, it's the reality of the fact that, of course, treason is being committed as uh, the government fails to defend the nation properly. Well, um, this gives me a nice introduction to a um, filmed interview that we will be pushing out very shortly, servant of the country, uh, betrayed by the state. Here's a little introduction and uh, then I'll talk to you. Um, I have rights. Um, I believe in my rights, defended my country on an ideology of truth and justice, um, and I believe in it strongly. And now knowing that it's totally false um, and corrupt, I won't stand for that. I won't stand to be bullied either. Um Well, that uh, interview, that videoed interview, will be coming out very, very soon. We think it's extremely powerful. And uh, what a classic case. Uh, we've got somebody yet again who has served their country. I could say queen and country. We'll leave the queen out for the moment. <laughs> Serve their country. And uh, the British state now attacking them with a vehemence that is nearly beyond belief, except this gentleman tells the truth. So stay with us, stay looking out for that. It will be out in the next couple of days, but we think a very, very powerful interview, really getting to the heart of the utter corruption that is now running Britain. The theme around children, and um, of course, if you're in the system, social worker, it doesn't matter what you do because all you're gonna get is a quick slap on the wrist. Have a look at community care here. So a social worker who recorded false supervision um, records and forged um, a supervisee's signature uh, simply gets a slap on the wrist and uh, they're just going to have a look at her practice for 12 months. Now, of course, many people have been in court and seen utter lies, perjury, fraudulent reports being put in by uh, social workers. We know this is not all of them, but we know this is a major problem. And, of course, the courts absolutely defend those fraudulent reports, the perjury, the lies. And what do they do? They penalise the parents. Well, many people say, yes, but why would they want to do that? Well, there is only one answer, because the British state is lying and covering up for massive child abuse. And uh, it took this brave MP, John Mann, to stand up in uh, Parliament recently and give a short talk. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. 
uh, have a look. It's only got 73 views on it, but I encourage you to look at it. And in his uh, speech to the House, he says, the scandal of historic child abuse in this country is going to be one of the defining issues in the next five years. To which I say, well, it would be, Mr. Mann, if the government doesn't um, succeed in covering it up. But let's have a look at his audience here, uh, because the usual thing was going on. Basically, a, a virtually empty parliament where many, you could just see the yawns on their faces on the subject of child abuse. So this is the heart of Britain. Uh, we've seen the Queen in all her ermine and gold and the carriages and the pomp and ceremony on the streets of London for consumption by the British public and the public overseas, of course, whilst the reality is we're living in a country with an utterly depraved, rotten core of politicians that unfortunately we have all allowed to be elected. And uh, what do they look like? Well, thanks to the mail here talking about the Queen opening parliament, here he is. This is, uh, of course, David Cameron uh, in his sharp suit, uh, upstanding young man, been to the right schools. Uh, trust him, David Cameron. Uh, well, what's the reality? Well, of course, David Cameron was the man who wanted to close down any talk of Westminster child sex abuse rings. Uh, luckily, MP Simon Danzuk uh, bowled him out on this. And here's the report in The Independent. And then who's he got next to him? Well, good old Harriet Harman. And let's remember that this is the lady linked to a paedophile group uh, that, amongst other things, wanted to lower the age of consent to allow sex with children and to allow people to take pornographic pictures of children. So it's, um, it's not difficult, Mike, is it, to uh, work out what's going wrong with Britain at the moment? No, not at all. Um, you know, going back to the social workers there and, um, you know, that they tend to use in a lot of cases that we see, you see, they see, we get this word again, qualified experts. Um, they're mentioned in the press a lot, but no names are mentioned. We get similar things going on in uh, so-called family courts, which is just star chambers, um, where these social workers are spending absolute thousands of pounds um, on these unqualified experts. I think there was a big expose either in the Telegraph or the Mail not so long ago about the amount of these experts that are being used in these cases. As for social workers, and you're saying, I'm sure there's some good ones. Um, I'm getting a bit tired of that phrase now, Brian, to be honest with you. I hear the same about the police. I hear the same you know, about social workers and people working in these um, private companies that are uh, abusing the system, as it were. Um, I, I don't think there are any good ones, to be honest, because um, you're not that very good if you're not willing to band together and expose what is criminal in my in my mind. Um, so I, I don't cover for these people anymore. They may be good. They may be good hearted people and they may be very nice socially. But if you're doing a job and you're covering this up, as far as I'm concerned, you're just as bad. Now, when it comes to child abuse and why um, we don't see such an uproar about it, I, I, I'm wondering where this all is with the amount of child abuse cases that have come out over the last um, year, certainly two years. Um, to be quite honest, the apathy is sickening because people make more of a scene about rainbow flags, Britain's got talent and the crap that's on our televisions, um, than rather think about not just the children that have been abused, but their, their children themselves. You know, we want to prevent this in the future. We want our children to have good education and not have to worry about paedophile teachers or people in um, the social care system abusing children. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm getting to a point where um, I, I won't tolerate any excuses now, like, oh, there must be good ones, because we don't see them. Where are these good ones? What are they doing? Uh, I share your passion there, Mike. I'll just add in uh, where we do see some of these people speaking out, of course, they're being threatened. What can the public do? Well, the public needs to come in and to support people who are doing the right thing. And, and I believe there's got to be a bit of give and take over this, because uh, we see um, we see M MPs like Mr. Danzuk, John Mann, uh, you could look back over some of the things they've done and you say, well, you could have done better, but they are, it seems, starting to do the right thing now would be good to get behind them. But take your point. Well, I couldn't resist um, this uh, bringing this man in because out of 
all the politicians, um, I personally think Nick Clegg is one of the most dangerous uh, yeah. because, of course, never really elected to any position of power, but then given immense power in the Privy Council. You don't really see him. He's the grey man. He's hiding in the background. Uh, the Mail here reporting that he struggled to deflect torture questions on LBC when he was interviewed. This is all to do with the rendition story, which I've covered. But let's remember that this politician as well, uh, another one, um, they're all working to cover up, amongst other stories, the story of the, of the abuse of children in Hampstead. The British establishment is terrified of this story because it starts to impact on everything dolphin square elm house westminster um, the great and the good even into the judiciary this is the story that's terrifying the british government and um, you know what can we say about um, nick clegg well politically groomed in matters to do with the eu by leon britain but of course, Nick Clegg was also the man that gently swept abuse of women in the Lib Dems. That all disappeared under the carpet. And uh, we're also being told by very, very good sources that, of course, uh, the Lib Dems were only too happy to join in the Labour Conservative pre-election secret deal to keep child abuse out of the election campaign. Uh, so thank you very much for those people connected to the uh, main parties who were kind enough to uh, give us that information. We've now had it corroborated from other people. So we can announce to the British public today, it is absolutely certain there was a dirty backdoor deal, uh, principally done by the Conservatives and Labour, so that they would not talk about child abuse in the election. Utter deceit on the public. Um, and so this is the other thing that I think makes this case so powerful. If we just put that one back, Nick, briefly, I've just added the statement there that, of course, this is the case where police officers are still being <coughs> threatened by other police officers to keep their, snout, their snouts out of the Hampstead case. Um, very, very serious stuff. And we'll end with just a reminder. Uh, uh, we call them the Dirty Dozen who were too, uh, only too happy to get into West London synagogue to celebrate the life of uh, Leon Britton. Uh, but these people, no progress on child abuse. And uh, I can tell our viewers and listeners today that uh, Melanie Shaw is back in the brutal punishment regime within profit-making Sodexo prison Peterborough. Uh, she's been back in solitary confinement and uh, in one of the letters that's now been received, we know that she's having an utterly brutal time. Um, as an ex-serviceman myself, um, and, and I share uh, Stuart, who, who we've done the interview with, he's saying, well, basically, he served his country thinking he was doing the right thing. You discover you are now working for a criminal, perverted elite. Uh, your ex-forces, it does make you pretty cynical, doesn't it? Definitely, definitely. And um, if that guy's um, coming out, I've got to stand behind him and we've got to stand behind him as well. I mean, as for the monarchy at this moment, it's something that we've all had to bow down to while she was in the forces. Um, once you see through what it's all about, um, respect and loyalty disappears. Mine's just totally gone. I couldn't be more disgusted with our monarchy um, at this very moment. But yeah, Nick Clegg, um, you know, he's he's had he's an apprentice of uh, some really interesting people. Um, you don't take much research on that, and it's quite right. I've listened to him on LBC, and every time um, CSA comes up, he he's ducking and diving the answers. And um, you know, it's all it's all it's all clear for us to see there. And by you confirming that the election promise between Labour and Conservatives not to discuss child sex abuse. Well, in my mind, it's it's a uh, denial and defensive move and to me it's criminal it's covering up state sponsored child sex abuse um, there's masses of cases across the country uh, involving masses of people we want to see some action now we don't want it covered up we want it out in the light but unfortunately most of the public are more concerned about um, uh, different color flags and um, the crap on their television to be concerned and we see what we saw that 
at the last vote at the elections, uh, Brian, unfortunately. Yep. Uh, well, well said, Mike, and uh, you've very nicely just given an inter introduction. The final subject, which I'll do very quickly today, but we're going to be looking into this more. Uh, uh, political somebody, somebody somewhere likes us because we've been getting a steady stream of interesting information from within political parties. Uh, we've been given this uh, interesting survey. This absolutely tells us what the real agenda for our political parties is. Never mind jobs and economy and looking after old people. Have a look at this little lot coming in. Uh, this is the Conservatives. Uh, they think they've got a lot more to do to champion rights for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people. Uh, they want to issue pardons to men convicted of sodomy and gross indecency. Uh, well, that would solve a lot of the abuse cases. Uh, they want to extend the laws to cover hate crimes, including transgender. They want to outlaw groups that foment hate. Uh, they've got plans for extremism disrupt, uh, disruptive orders. Uh, they're going to support homosexualization of sex education. Um, they've got a stonewall advisor to the education secretary. Abortion, they would support lowering the 42-week abortion limited. Um, and and um, Cameron is for animal-human hybrid embryos. Uh, British values. British, British values are now pink laws to support the uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual agenda. And all of this is going to be enforced at law. So I'm just giving people a taster today. This is just what the Conservatives have got in line for this country. Uh, tomorrow, I'll take the uh, banner off some of those other ones and we'll have a look at what the other parties are talking about. So this is the real state of Cameron's perverted government, a creeping dictatorship, uh, which encompasses a massive attack on Britain's uh, normal heterosexual families. No doubt I will have upset a few people, but really it's time for the truth to come out and we're going to stick with the truth and the facts. Mike, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody else that's uh, tuned in today. And as always, a big thank you to our overseas viewers, especially those of you in Taiwan. We'll be back same time tomorrow with uh, Northern Exposure with David Scott. Thanks very much. Bye bye.